for all of you on Ustream and all of you who are watching on recorded media. We're very glad you decided to join us today. We're going to talk about a very important message. We're talking about the rescue of the saints. We call this Rescue 101. We started two weeks ago. We're going to take it up now from a very important part, and that is the holy seventh-day Sabbath of the Lord God Almighty. So this is Rescue 101, Shabbat, as we're going to typically call it. And I want to speak to those of you who are Sunday believers in Jesus Christ. By that I mean you go to church on Sunday as opposed to the true seventh-day Sabbath. We're not here to prove to you today which day is the seventh-day Sabbath. We're here to make a connection between the rescue of the saints and the seventh-day Sabbath. So if you're a Sunday believer in Jesus Christ, I want to talk to you directly first before I get into this message. And I want to tell you that we love you. What we're going to present to you today is nothing to condemn you. It is nothing to make you feel bad. We're not trying to hurt your feelings or put you down in any way. But I want you to understand that the Sabbath was given through Moses, and it is on Saturday on our Roman calendar. The Jewish people have kept this from the giving of the manna. They have kept it intact from Friday night to Saturday night. That is the Sabbath of the living God. And again, I'm not here to try to prove that today. We have a book that you can order from us at Hungry Hearts Ministries called a Holy Time with God, which does cover the Sabbath. What I'm going to cover today is in our book, Come Away With Me. This is the Zulon version of this book. You can purchase this at any bookstore in America, or you can get an, an e-book copy uh, from Amazon.com uh, or Barnes & Nobles for your Kindle or any device that you want to read electronic books on. Anyway, this book is available everywhere. Come away with me. We go through everything about the coming rescue of the saints by Jesus Christ. And this, everything presented today is in the chapter mark, the Sabbath day. Uh, but I want to talk to you for a minute, because in the Sunday world, you perceive things completely different than the Sabbath world perceives them. The Sabbath world perceives time based on cycles, weekly cycles of you work six days and take off the Sabbath day. The Sunday world is you go to church, you can do whatever you want, you don't have to take off any day at all. Also, the Sunday world seems to be consumed with this going to heaven or going to hell, going to heaven or going to hell. So we try to explain to people the Sabbath. One of the first things that they challenge us with is, what, are you saying I'm going to hell? No, I'm not saying you're going to hell. Uh, everything in the Sabbath world is based about God's kingdom coming to earth. Jesus ruling and reigning on this earth over people and ruling with the converted saints. This has nothing to do with heaven or hell. This has to do with your position in God's kingdom. So am I saying that you'll have a greater position in God's kingdom if you keep the seventh day Sabbath? Yes, I am. And you can look that up in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17 to 20. Jesus Christ said that you will have a better position in his kingdom if you keep this Sabbath day. I didn't say that. He did. Also, everything is about the coming rescue of the saints. And that is based upon your keeping of the Ten Commandments. The Sabbath is the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments. Now, none of you would disagree that adultery would disqualify you from keeping, from obtaining the rescue of the saints. Unrepented adultery would keep you out. Unrepented murder would keep you out. Unrepented theft would keep you out. And yet, all of you think that you can break the fourth commandment of keeping the Sabbath and that God is still going to rescue you because you're a believer. I got news for you. You cannot break any of God's Ten Commandments and make the rescue of the saints. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. James said if you break one commandment, you break all commandments. So in his equation, he said if you lie, you're a murderer because if you break one, you break them all. How much more so the Sabbath which is considered by many to be the queen of the commandments. So as I get into this message, I don't want you to just turn away and say, Pastor Bill's a freak. I want you to listen carefully to all of the references to the Sabbath and the rescue of the saints. And to reconsider your view of God's seventh day Sabbath because you are overlooking it to your peril. We're not bringing this up to condemn you. We're bringing this up pleading with you for your very life. So we're going to start out with what is the Great Tribulation. You turn with me to Revelation 13. What is the Great Tribulation? 
And this is an important question to the rescue because why do you need rescue? Why do you need to be rescued by Jesus Christ? You need to be rescued from the coming great tribulation. That's why you need rescue. So what is the great tribulation that, that you need rescue? Verse 1, I saw a beast in Revelation 13. I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads and with ten crowns on his horns and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard but had the feet like those of a bear and the mouth like that of a lion. And the dragon gave the beast his power and throne and great authority. And I want you to I want to point out to you that the four beasts of Daniel chapter 7... The four beasts of Daniel chapter 7 are represented in this beast in, in Daniel 13. The satanic kingdom looks like Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome. It's an amalgamation of all of them. So they took the things out of Babylon and rolled them up into Persia. They took the things from Babylon and Persia and rolled them up into Greece. They took the things from Babylon, Persia, and Greece and rolled them up into Rome. And so this final beast is an amalgamation of all of these empires. And so this is what you're looking at here. So you have a satanic kingdom represented by this amalgamated beast. And then you have a worldly version of this satanic kingdom. And we call it the Holy Roman Empire as it is ruled the last six of the last seven times in that form, and it's going to come back again in that same form. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. This fatal wound was when Rome was sacked in 476 AD by the Ostrogoths. So the barbarians came and sacked Rome, so the head of the beast that represents the Roman Empire was killed and then healed. And because of the horns, we know that there would be seven resurrections of this Roman Empire, and there have been seven resurrections. And if you go to uh, Revelation 17, which we're not going to go, it says that the next Antichrist is an eighth king who belongs to the seven resurrections of this Holy Roman Empire. So this is forming right now in front of your very eyes. Daniel chapter 11 says the king of the south will push it the king of the north. That's what you saw last Friday night with the massacre in Paris. The king of the south is pushing at the king of the north. The king of the north is now going to come against him like a whirlwind with many ships and chariots. So we've been preaching this now the whole time Hungry Hearts has been here. Uh, Herbert Armstrong preached it before me, the great men at the, the many splits from the Worldwide Church of God who adhere to the truth and living and global and united and all the others have all been preaching the same thing. So we've all been consistent in our message that this is what is coming, and now you're watching it happen on Fox News. Right. Amen? Mm -hmm. So now, this is all coming. The whole world has been astonished and followed the beast. So when this beast comes together this last time, the whole world is going to be astonished and they're going to follow the beast. Did not they pass a resolution out of the UN Security Council yesterday agreeing with France that we're all going to turn and fight the king of the south right now? It was unanimous. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast and asked who is like the beast and who can make war against him. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. These 42 months are the time of the great tribulation. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. And he was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. This is the great tribulation. The problem comes down with the definition of the word saint. Because everybody wants to make it about the Sunday believers versus Islam, and that is not correct. There has never been a great tribulation from the time of Hadrian, emperor of Rome, until this day that was between Islam and the saints. Oh, they've had, in, in, in Sunday Christendom, they had their wars back and forth with each other, but they were not what we're talking about. This is not talking about a war between Sunday Christianity and Islam. Though they've had the Crusades and fought back and forth many times, 
This war has always been against the Sabbath people of God in the form of persecuting Sabbath-keeping Christians, as they called it, for Judaizing and persecuting our Jewish brothers. And if they had been successful, you would not have a Torah or an Old Testament in your Bible. The only reason you have it is because the God protected the Jewish people with that Torah. So turn over with me to Daniel chapter 7 and let's clear some of this up. You see, you can't look at the New Testament prophecies without the Old Testament prophecies. And the Old Testament prophecies have the key for your New Testament prophecies. They go together. You cannot look at them separate. You have to put them together because they have the keys to explain each other. Daniel has a vision. Four beasts, as we alluded to earlier, came out of the earth. The first one represented Babylon. The second one represented Persia. The third one represented Greece. The fourth dreadful and terrible beast represented Rome. And out of Rome there were ten horns, which were the ten barbarian kingdoms that conquered Rome. And then there grew up a little horn who overthrew three horns and spoke blasphemies and proud words and persecuted the saints, as we're going to read. Daniel 7, verse 19. Then I want to know about the true meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying, with its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. But I also want to know about the ten horns on its head and the, about the other little horn which came up before which three of them fell. And that horn that looked more imposing than the others and had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. And as I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them. This horn that comes up out of the Roman and ruins of the Roman Empire has never been Islam, and it cannot be. This horn that comes up is the Roman church that threw down three kingdoms out of the old Roman Empire. They were the Burgundians, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. All three of those uh, barbarian kingdoms kept Aryan, an Aryan form of Christianity, which meant they kept the Sabbath, the holy days, and they believed in the Holy Spirit as the essence of God and not a separate person. And the Roman church had them thrown down through Justinian, emperor of Rome in 554 AD because they wanted the supremacy. That's the truth. That's what happened. It's always been about the Sunday believers persecuting the Sabbath believers. And those of you at the end of the age, you don't know your history. Those of you at the end of the age who don't understand what has gone on before, and many of you refuse to look because you don't want to be bothered with it. But let me tell you something. This is about to come back, and you're about to take the mark of the beast for not looking at the facts in front of your eyes. You've been blinded to the truth by the lies, and I'm begging you, open up your eyes and look. It's right there in front of your face. Take the mark of God and live. Until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High. The saints of the Most High were persecuted in the whole civilized world by the Roman Church in some of the worst manners ever done in the history of humanity. And it's going to come back. This whole Western free world as we know it is about to be organized into a war against Islam. And those of us who adhere to the Seventh-day Sabbath are going to be called haters for refusing to go along. And they're going to show the atrocities of the Muslims, and they're going to say that because we don't want to join with them in fighting the Muslims, that we are haters. When nothing can be further from the truth, the atrocities of the Muslims need addressing. That is without a doubt mm -hmm. correct. On the other hand, we don't need to join in with the forces of the Holy Roman Empire because they don't ever come to a good place. The Holy Roman Empire and the Roman Church that goes with it cannot be a part of the kingdom of God because they set themselves up in opposition to the kingdom of God. We have to be the people of God who turn to the right. Now this started a very long time ago. This controversy first broke out between Anicetus, Bishop of Rome, and Polycarp, who was a disciple of the Apostle John. When John died in, in roughly 100 A.D., Polycarp was Bishop of Smyrna, and he openly opposed the Bishop of Rome for Sunday worship and the keeping of Easter as opposed to the Sabbath worship and the keeping of Passover. This controversy within the early church was known as the Quarto Decimian Controversy, which is Latin for 14. 
keeping of the Passover on the 14th of Nisan. So you've heard me preaching here many, many times that it is imperative that you keep the true Passover of Jesus Christ on the 14th of Nisan. It is imperative. All my Messianic brothers are a day late and a dollar short for keeping it on the 15th. I can't help that. I, I'm sorry. I wish you guys would wake up and come back over. The 14th is when you keep the Passover. The 15th is when you keep the first day of unleavened bread. I it's know. not that you don't keep the 15th. You don't keep Passover on the 15th. Even in the time of Moshe, the Passover was on the 14th. And it is easily proven from the book of Numbers that if you didn't keep Passover on the 14th, you weren't here to talk about it on the 15th. Right. So this, this controversy is argued. Polycarp said John always kept the Sabbath, and John never kept Sunday. You can look it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica. I'm not telling you anything weird or, 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 or exotic. Everything I'm telling you, you can easily look up from any common historical source. Amen? These aren't dusty books out of a library somewhere that no one's ever seen in the last 50 years. I'm telling you easy stuff. Now look, Brother Mac is buying all those books that haven't seen the light of day in 50 years because he wanted the source documents. Amen? Mm -hmm. The next generation, the controversy was between Victor, Bishop of Rome, and Polycrates, who was a disciple of Polycarp, and he was bishop at Ephesus. So you had John the Apostle, whom God gave the book of Revelation. John the Apostle, who was the disciple that Jesus loved and who laid on his breast on that night of Passover. His disciple, Polycarp, opposed Anacetus, Bishop of Rome, over Sunday and Easter, and said that the church in Rome was an error. In the next generation, Polycrates, who sat on the knees of Polycarp as a little boy and was raised up in the true church of God, keeping Sabbath and Passover on the 14th of Nisan, he goes to confront Victor, Bishop of Rome. And this is how the office of the papacy was born, because Victor, Bishop of Rome, excommunicated Polycrates and all of the churches in the East that adhered to the Sabbath and the Holy Days, and he was the first bishop of Rome to claim supremacy over the rest of the church. And a few months later, after all the other bishops had come to Rome and leaned on Victor, Victor stood down and reinstated the churches of the East. But i got to tell you, well past Dr. Arius, from whom Arianism came, his name, the churches of the East up into the 500s A.D. kept the Sabbath and the Passover on the 14th of Nisan in defiance of the Bishop of Rome. But it was in the 500s A.D. under the Emperor of Rome, Justinian, that Sabbath keeping was expunged from the eastern half of the empire. You either went to Sunday or you were killed. It's just that simple. I want to talk to you about the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed was instituted in 321 AD to abolish Sabbath keeping from the church. It was followed up by the Nicene Council of 325 where they forbade Sabbath keeping on pain of death. It was followed up by 364 at the Council of Laodicea, where they reaffirmed that. When Constantine, quote-unquote, got saved in the Roman church and came to the emperor of Rome and made Sunday Christianity the religion of the empire, Sabbath keepers were killed. If you kept Sabbath, it's called Judaizing on the Sabbath. If you were Judaized on the Sabbath, they killed you. They killed you. It took your property and gave it to whoever they wanted to. If you kept Passover on the 14th of Nisan, they put you to death. This is the forerunner of the Great Tribulation, and this went for 1,260 years of the Holy Roman Empire exterminating Sabbath-keeping Christians and Jews. This is well before Muhammad is born. Muhammad's great-grandfather wasn't born in 321 when they began to remove Sabbath-keeping Christianity. Islam is not a counterfeit Christianity. Islam is not Satan's uh, form of duping you out of the truth. It's, look, it's a bad religion. Those are evil people. 
You know, I know they're supposedly uh, good Muslims. They say that. But then the president said, if you say radical Islam, it makes good Muslims radical. So if that's already in their heart and that's all you've got to do to radicalize them, how good can they be? That's not a deceit. You can openly see that that is wrong. What little they have right, like the part of the dietary laws they keep, they got from Jewish rabbis. So they got some stuff from Jewish rabbis, and you have Muhammad's garbled up version of, of the early stories of the Bible. It's just a mess. It is Sunday Christianity where the problem lies, because that's the deceit and the deception that makes you think there's a moral equivalence to going to church on Sunday versus going to church on Saturday. And God has winked at this for a long time, but the time of his looking the other way is over. God is making his list and checking it twice. This ain't about heaven or hell. This is about rescue or tribulation. The problem is if you're sold out to Sunday Christianity, you're going to take the mark of the beast. Now, a lot of you have seen the Left Behind movies. And you are used to seeing the movies where they uh, tattoo the mark on your hand. They're not going to tattoo you. The mark of the Roman Empire is to keep Sunday in place of Saturday. Yep. And it has been since the beginning. Look, I told you, Anacetus versus Polycarp. This is one, this is the next generation from the apostles. Paul Victor versus Polycrates. This is the second generation from the apostles, and you have the heresy coming in. Let me ask you a question. If keeping Sunday in place of Saturday was okay, then why did God destroy the northern nation, the ten tribes of Israel, carry them off as captive slaves, captive in Afghanistan, and you've never heard of them since, and they've lost their identity? If it's okay, why did God do that to Israel, his own chosen, beloved people? And I'm telling you, Saturday is the mark of God. And that is why he has preserved the Jewish people through all the persecution and all the diaspora because even when they didn't keep the Sabbath, they acknowledged the Sabbath as the right day. Even when they said, even when they were wrong, they said, we're wrong, Sabbath is the right day. They preserved the Sabbath and God has preserved them. Let's go to Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. I may mean, tell you one time I'm a Ten Commandment Libertarian. I'm thinking to myself, there's no way, dude. I mean, you know, I like him and all that, but he can't be a Ten Commandment libertarian when he's committing fornication and not keeping the Sabbath. That's not a Ten Commandment libertarian. A Ten Commandment libertarian means you show up on Sabbath services every week you can get there. Y'all get that. I understand everybody has a week here and there. The car breaks down. I can't get a ride. This, I'm sick. I'm, I'm contagious sick. Blah, 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 blah. But every week that you're not one of those, your butt got to be in service. Amen. I hate to be so blunt about it, but that's just the way it is. Some people got to have it that way. I'm sorry. But that's just the way they got to have it. Exodus 20 are the Ten Commandments spoken by God. The Jewish rabbis say that when God spoke, the letters of his words came out off the top of the mountain in fire. In fire. So... Literally, it's ten words in Hebrew. And you see the paragraphs in English. That's why it's called the Decalogue, ten words. Amen? Came off the mountain in fire as he spoke. But you come down here to verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. It doesn't say forget the Sabbath day. It doesn't say change it to Sunday. It says remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall work and do all your work. A lot of us don't like to have to work six days. This is one of those weeks when I have to work six days. I'm not too happy about it. But you know what? Amen. We're going to do it. We're going to work all six of them. Praise God I have it. Amen. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. Do you realize that the Roman church has already changed the calendars in Europe to show Sunday as the seventh day when it's not? Their calendars start on Monday in Europe and end on Sunday to try to make it look like they're keeping the seventh day holy. But the week don't start with Monday. It starts with Sunday. And it ends with Saturday, as we say it in the South. <laughs> so the Jewish Sabbath given to them by God Almighty himself 
starts Friday night at sundown on our Roman calendar and ends Saturday night at sundown on our Roman calendar. On the Hebrew calendar, it's called first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, Shabbat. Uh -huh. That's how God gave it. He didn't name the other days of the week. He numbered them because, hey, at sundown, it's only going to be six days until Shabbat. Get On it, you shall not do any work. Neither you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that's in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Honor your... So there it is. There's the, there's the fourth commandment. How can you break the fourth commandment and make the rescue of the saints if you can't break any of the others of these and you can't make the rescue of the saints? These are not a dividable, you pick and choose buffet. This is one whole that you have to live and keep if you expect to make the rescue of the saints. Well, let's go to Isaiah 56. Talking about the rescue. Both Isaiah 56 and Isaiah 58 talk about the rescue of the saints in the time of the end. I showed you that Yeshua's name means he rescues you from your earthly enemies. Amen? Amen. Earthly enemies. We have to understand the rescue is about your earthly enemies who are about to inflict the great tribulation on this earth. But a lot of people on earth are going to go through the great tribulation completely unaware because they don't understand that if you are in Sunday... You are exempt. No one's coming to kill you for keeping Sunday. They're going to come and kill you for keeping Sabbath. <coughs> Just like they did in the past. Isaiah 56. This is what the Lord says. Maintain justice and do what is right for my salvation is close at hand. This word salvation is translated rescue in many other places. And it can just as easily be rescue in this. When the rescue is at hand. When the rescue of the saints is at hand, maintain justice and do what is right. What is right? My righteousness will soon be revealed. The revealing of God's righteousness is the rescue of the saints because he is not going to let the righteous people of God suffer affliction. Blessed is the man who does this, the man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it. This is Isaiah 56, and God is telling you, in the day of my rescue, blessed is the man who keeps the Sabbath, who does not desecrate it, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let no foreigner who has bound himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let not any eunuch complain, I'm only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, and choose what pleases me, and hold fast to my covenant. You see here how he's linked his covenant. Your covenant with God is based on your keeping the Sabbath. Your covenant with God to get out of here is based on your keeping the Sabbath and holding it fast. To them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters, and I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. Foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, and to worship him, all who keep the Sabbath. Not Sunday. I'm going to keep the Sabbath, not Easter, Passover. you got to keep the things that God gave, not the things man made up. When you are trusting in men, you have no hope and no faith. But when you're trusting in God, you can believe in confidence. Amen. These I will bring back to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Now, this is not possible because there's no temple. This would not be possible if there were a temple because none of us would be qualified to go there. This can only be in the rescue of the saints because the only holy mountain and the only holy temple that you can be brought to is the one that stands in heaven where the Father sits on the throne and ministers to the people who have gone ahead of us. And look, I came from a worldwide background. We're not talking about going to heaven as an end game. We're talking about going to heaven for dinner. We're going for dinner and we're coming back on white horses to rule with the Lord on this earth for a thousand years. It ain't about heaven and hell as the Sunday world likes to look at it. It's about God's kingdom and your position in that kingdom based on your willingness to obey him right now. Right now in this space and time. Isaiah 58.
Verse 13. If you keep your feet from breaking my Sabbath, and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight, and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land, and you will feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. Amen. Now, does that not show you the imagery of the bride being carried in the aperion to the wedding? He's going to lift you up and carry you on the heights of the land. It says when he rescues the saints, he comes down in the clouds, and we go up to meet him. He comes down to the clouds and we go up to meet him, carried, carried, riding on the heights of the land. You see, it all comes back down to the Sabbath day. This is so critical. Honoring his Sabbath from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Not going your own way, not doing your own pleasure, but devoting that time to God in true holiness and righteousness and giving him your love and affection on this time that he has made to be with you. Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel was given his prophecies and was told to prophesy to the northern tribes 150 years after they were carried away captive and were lost. So his prophecy to the Israelites of the northern tribes cannot be for their day because he prophesied after they were gone. They have to be for our day. We have materials that you can order, the U.S. and Britain and Bible Prophecy. Uh, we have a five uh, CD uh, message set on that. Uh, Evangelist Kelly Mack has a new book on it that you can order through the ministry. And we are the lost tribes of Israel. We are specifically from the house of Joseph. We are Israel. These words apply to these United States as we live here. God is not happy that we, the house of Joseph, do not keep his Sabbath day holy. And we're going to suffer for it greatly. Verse 12. I also gave them my Sabbath as a sign between us so that they would know that I'm the Lord that made them holy. The only way you can know that the true creator God is the one making you holy is when you keep his Sabbath day holy. It is the sign he gave you to know who the true God is and to know that you are a part of the true God and a part of the true church and a saint. It's the only sign you have. So God himself, and we're going to get to there in Exodus, says that the Sabbath is your sign from him. It's his mark on you, and Sunday is the devil's mark. Mm -hmm. They said so. I didn't. That's not, that's not a bit of best saith Bill Schultz. That is a decision made in 321 AD, 325 AD, 364 AD, carried out with force of arms and militaries and armies rounding up people. The, the forced baptisms in the reign of Charlemagne were so bad that even the Roman priests couldn't stand to watch it. They couldn't even stand to watch it. Convert to the Roman church or die by the sword. It has been this way from the beginning and it's going to be this way in the end. Yet the people of Israel rebelled against me in the desert. They did not follow my decrees but rejected my laws. Although the man who obeys them will live by them and they utterly desecrated my Sabbath. So I said I would pour out my wrath on them and destroy them. That's where we're at right now. We have utterly rejected his Sabbath, and we have utterly desecrated them, and we utterly refuse to turn back to God Almighty, the true God, with the true Sabbath day, and he is going to destroy the United States of America. We were watching some news last night and listening to various political prescriptions for our problems, but our problem comes down to this. As long as we disobey God, God has now turned his back on the United States. There is no political solution to our problems. The only solution is a theological solution where we repent as people and turn back to God on his Sabbath and his holy days and repent before him in sackcloth and ashes. That is the only hope for the United States of America. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I look at our wonderful, fine men and women in the United States military service and I think that they, we the civilians in this country are not worthy of them because we do not repent and live right before God and we have put them in harm's way as a result. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 26. I didn't write this book, guys. God wrote this stuff. I'm just reading it. Verse 26. Her priests do violence to my law. You can go to every church in the United States except those offshoots of the worldwide church, and they will tell you that 
God's law is done away. How much more violent can you be to the law of God than to say that it doesn't exist anymore and we don't have to do it? Her priests do violence to my law and they profane my holy things. When they tell you it's okay to eat animals that God said do not eat, when they tell you it's okay to engage in conduct God said do not engage in and you must wash with water and wait until sundown after you do it, then they are do profaning the holy things of God. Christians, the saints of God Almighty are supposed to be making themselves holy before God, which means you don't touch the unclean thing. And that, that Paul quotes that in the New Testament. Touch not the unclean thing, and God will be your God, and you can be his people. But the churches in America teach to touch the unclean thing and to work and desecrate the Sabbath day, doing violence to God's law. A clear prophecy for our times in which we live. They do not distinguish between the holy and the common. Worse, they promote the common and denigrate the holy. They teach there's no difference between unclean and clean. How many people have we taught about the dietary laws and the cleanliness laws? Only to have them go back to their pastor and their pastor say, well, there's no, the dietary laws are done away. There's no difference between clean and unclean. And here it is. God predicted it thousands of years before it happened, and we're living in it, and we have do not have the eyes to open up and see because we've been blinded to the truth by the deceit of the devil. And we have to open those eyes and see the lies and see that God called this out thousands of years ago. If it doesn't matter, then why is God so angry about it in Ezekiel? If it doesn't matter, then why is God about to destroy the United States? And you can see it happening in front of your very eyes on Fox News. If God is okay with it, then why is all this happening? He's not okay. He's angry. And it is not cool to have God angry, especially when the tribulation is about to break out and the Christians are going to get killed. Which side of this do you want to be on? Like I said, I don't have the animosity for my Sunday friends. I love you dearly. That's why I'm begging and pleading with you for your very life. Because if you seek to gain your life by living that way, you are going to lose it in the tribulation. And I'm asking you to give your life to Jesus, all of it. When I say give your life, that means you live the way he lived. What did Jesus do? He kept the Sabbath. Always. Or he couldn't have been your Savior. If Jesus had sinned by breaking Sabbath, then he would not be able to pay for your yeah. And they shut their eyes to the keeping of my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. Our priests, the pastors and the teachers and the bishops and the folk all shut their eyes to the keeping of God's Sabbath and God is profaned among us. We cannot be this way. This is not going to make the rescue of the saints. Ezekiel, uh, Exodus chapter 31. God Almighty wants to rescue everybody who has received his blood on their soul. He wants to rescue every single person that has accepted him as their Savior. But we are living contrary to the Bible on such a level that God says we will have to be destroyed. Don't make yourself have to go through getting your head chopped off. Because after the rescue, that's your only choice. Keep your head firmly affixed to your shoulders where it belongs. Serve God and escape. Amen? Mm -hmm. Exodus 31, verse 12. <clears throat> then the Lord said to Moshe, Say to the Israelites, I just want to point out, this is God talking. This is not Moses talking. This is God talking to Moses. Now, my Sunday brothers, which one of you has ever had God come down and talk to you the way Moses, God talked to Moses? It don't happen, does it? Forget the stuff you learned in the cemetery. I mean the seminary. <laughs> Go right to the very word of God. God spoke all these words to Moses as a man speaks to his friend face to face. Come on, Moses, the stuff in Moses is the most important stuff in here because God Almighty, the one we know as Jesus Christ, sat down in the tent of meeting and told it to Moses face to face, man to man. This is real deal stuff. You must observe my Sabbaths. Not maybe, not when it's convenient, not when you feel like it. You must observe my Sabbaths because this is going to be a sign between me and you forever. This phrase for the generations to come is the Hebrew ha'olam, and it means forever. There is never going to be a time when the Sabbath is not in existence. 
Ever, 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 forever, and ever, and ever, and ever, amen. Sabbath is permanent. Sabbath is permanent. You cannot break Sabbath and get away with it. God is going to punish you. Watch this. So you may know that I'm the Lord that makes you holy. The only way that you can know that the true yod hey bob hey is the one making you holy is to keep his Sabbath, which the Jews keep from Friday night to Saturday night. Judaizing is not a crime. Judaizing is a goal that every one of us needs to, oh, come on, somebody. You need to attain to the goal of living up to it. As a matter of fact, Jesus in that passage I mentioned earlier, Matthew 5, 17 to 20, says you've got to keep it better than they do or you're not even going in the kingdom of heaven. Observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. Whoever does any work on that day must be cut off from his people. For six days work is to be done. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. And then he repeats it. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day must be put to death. You're standing in front of the great tribulation. How do you think you're going to escape the death penalty in there if you are breaking God's Sabbath day? I'm telling you right now, you are not. If you are breaking the Sabbath, if you if you're a Sabbath believer, if you've gotten weak, you need to get on your knees and repent because God Almighty is going to put you in the tribulation to try your heart and soul in the fire if you don't repent and get back on fire for God in his Sabbath day. The Sabbath day is not play. The Sabbath day is God's sign to know who to spare in the end time. And we're here. This is the end time. Are you going to be spared or are you going to be killed? I said that real first. Southernism. The Sabbath day carries a death penalty for breaking, and you are not going to mock God in the scam. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he abstained from work and rested. Because God rested, he's requiring you to rest. God didn't need to rest, but he knows you do. And even if you don't need to rest, he's made time out of his busy schedule to spend it with you. And you need to stop what you're doing because you're not that important and you're not that busy that you can't make time to be with God. God is that busy, and he is more than enough that important, and he has stopped what he's doing to be with you. You can stop what you're doing to be with him. Now, Pastor Bill, that's all New Testament, and we're in the New, we're New Testament. We're New Testament Christians. Well, you like to think you are, but the New Testament is having God's laws written on your heart. And if you're not, if his laws aren't on your heart, you're still not in it yet. Mm. But let's just go to Matthew and see what Jesus has to say about the subject. Because if you really are a New Testament Christian, then you must live by the red letter words of Jesus Christ or you are going in the lake of fire. Matthew chapter 12, verse 6. I tell you the truth that one greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Well, he's not the Lord of pagan Sunday. He's the Lord of Sabbath. Let me tell you a little secret about Hebrew. When he declared himself the Lord of the Sabbath, he permanently and irrevocably attached himself to the Sabbath. You cannot retrieve him from the Sabbath, and you cannot put him into Sunday because he don't go. He's Lord of the Sabbath, and you can't take him out of it because he's permanently and irrevocably attached to it. So if he lives in you, you are supposed to be permanently and irrevocably attached to it. And if you're still so attached to Sunday that you can't keep the Sabbath, you are saying by definition that this Jesus, the one in Matthew, does not live in you. Because Jesus is a Jewish rabbi. And so these things have Hebrew meanings beyond just their mere English words. And if he is Lord of the Sabbath, that means he encompasses it, and he fills it, and he rules it. And if you're over here on Sunday, he's not there. You're worse than a day late, a dollar short. You're playing in somebody else's house. Mark chapter 6. Look. Don't come back to me and say, oh, Pastor Bill said we're all going to hell. Because I didn't say that. <laughs> You're looking at everything, heaven versus hell. It's kingdom of God. 
It's kingdom of God. What you need to do is repent and come back to the Sabbath where you belong. Because that's where the true people of God have been. God has winked at these transgressions for a time, but that time is rapidly drawing to a close. And it's going to be real simple. Either you is, is you is, or is you ain't. Either you are in the Sabbath and you're a saint of God and you can go to the rescue, or you're not a saint of God and you're not going in the rescue. And the only way to redeem yourself is to die in the tribulation. But if you're deceived in the Sunday now, what makes you think you're going to wake up to this Sabbath versus Sunday truth in the tribulation? When you don't have any Sabbath keepers left to tell you the difference. And all you have are my books and tapes. This isn't going to help you too much after it's all done. You need to be following this stuff right now while you still have time to escape. Mark chapter 6 verse 2. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. Well, how about that? Well, how about that? Oh, well, Pastor Bill, he's, he's in Judea. They're all Jews. You don't understand the study, story of Hanukkah? Where a lot of the Jews became Greeks, even reversing their circumcision and worshiping in the Greek temples on Sunday. You realize the whole pagan world kept Sunday. You realize the whole pagan world has always kept Sunday since Nimrod at the Tower of Babel. And it's always had a mother and child God. And that's why every pagan culture has the same pantheon of gods. Because they all came from Nimrod and Semiramis after the flood at the Tower of Babel. And this is being perpetuated in quote-unquote Christian churches every single year. Talking about some things last night. Hebrew thought does not celebrate your birthday. It celebrates the day of your death. So Jesus said, do this in remembrance of my death. Paul said, you proclaim the death of the Lord Jesus till he comes. Nowhere does it ever say anything about honoring his birthday, which could never possibly have been on December 25th. If you take the, the circuit of the priests, John the Baptist and Jesus are born six months apart. If you take the order of the priest, you cannot get Jesus born in December 25th. If you take the shepherds abiding in the field, they came in for the fast, which means that it, he couldn't have been born on a, the Day of Atonement in the fall. He had to be born before the Day of Atonement in the fall because when they came in for the fast, they're already in for the fast. They don't go back out again. The temple shepherds where Jesus was born were the flocks to be sacrificed at tabernacles. And I know some hold that he was born on tabernacles, but that's already two weeks too late because those lambs are being sacrificed now. Year old lambs. <laughs> Not two year old lambs. They're being sacrificed at the temple. Jesus was born on Rosh Hashanah in the fall. He wasn't born on December 25th, and besides that, he said, don't celebrate his birthday, celebrate the day of his death. Do you honor the day of his death? The day of his death was 14 Nisan, 31 AD. Come on, somebody. Right. So that's why it's important to keep the Passover on the 14th day of Nisan, because you're honoring the Lord's death until he comes. Can't do that on the 15th. But here he is, here he is in the synagogue teaching on the Sabbath because he's a rabbi. He's teaching on the Sabbath because he's a rabbi. He's supposed to be your rabbi, but how can he be your rabbi if you're on Sunday? How can you make the rescue of the saints if you are defying the living God on one of the most important of the top four commandments? You can't. You can't. Matthew 24. Jesus is going to give us a little verse. In verse 20. Talking about a time still ahead of us. Time still ahead of us. Matthew 24, verse 20. Pray that your flight, interesting word, flight, Rescue, flight, arpeggio, zoo, catching away, flight, right on the heights, right on the height. 
one, one person got it. Pray that your flight will not take place in the winter or on the Sabbath. Well, hold on a minute. If the Sabbath was done away in 321 A.D. by the Roman church, then why would it matter about an event still in front of us if it's on the Sabbath day? You see, it matters whether your flight takes place on the Sabbath because he's rescuing the people who were keeping the Sabbath. Red letters, I didn't make them up. Your only choice is whether you're going to believe Jesus or not. He's going to rescue those who were keeping the Sabbath in the time just in front of us now. So, as I said before, we don't hate you, we love you. We're begging and pleading with you to make the change you have to make. Pastor Bell, I don't have a Sabbath church. You could have. You could have. If everybody stays in Sunday, you won't have. But if you will all start coming to Sabbath and coming out of Sunday, then you will have. Mm -hmm. You may keep it home for a few weeks until you find out your other Sunday friends have converted like you. It's a whole different way of life. It's a whole different theology. And everything is different. Nothing is the same. There is no moral equivalence between Sunday and Sabbath. Sabbath is God's holy mark on you that he's making you holy. Sabbath is God's holy time to spend with you. Many of my Sunday Pentecostal friends have said they need revival. They want to move in the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you right now, you're just on the wrong day. If you will just go to church on Sabbath and you start consecrating yourself, distinguishing between holy and common, clean and unclean, and doing the things that God says, the things that we're teaching you, you will have a breakout of revival that will blow your mind. Because you see, God gave this stuff for our benefit, not the other way around. The law has never been a burden. What is a burden is the fact that we have a nature that desires sin. But as, you know, my Pentecostal friends, you don't acknowledge a lot of sin and you call it losing the victory. For some reason, you think that if you sin, you're going to go to hell. Look here. We all break God's commandments, whether it's in deed or thought or emotion. We repent of those twice a year before Passover and atonement, and God washes us and makes us clean with the blood of Jesus Christ. So it doesn't it matters in that you want to strive to please him. It matters that the more you strive to please him, the closer your relationship is. But let's face it, for every infraction of deed, heart, mind, thought, or word, it requires the blood of Jesus to clean them all. I'm telling you right now, if you will come over in the Sabbath, the scales will fall off of your eyes and your Amen. understanding will be open and the Holy Ghost will burn brighter in you and cleaner in you and freer in you. Amen. For those of you who aren't Pentecostal, your understanding of the word is what drives you. All of my great Baptist friends, don't you understand that you have to actually live all of these words? Don't explain away the words you're uncomfortable with. Embrace them because in it you're going to find freedom for your soul. And you're going to find a new depth and a closeness with Jesus that you've never had in your life. And all of a sudden you're going to be able to hear clearly the, the, the mind of the Lord and the will of the Lord for your life. For all my ex-worldwide friends, we're going to dinner. You like to go to dinner, huh? When I was a kid, Dad said we're going to dinner. We had to go dress up, put on a little suit and a little clip on tie, and wash our face and comb our hair and get the mud off our shoes. We're going to dinner. We're going to go to the wedding supper of the Lamb. It's something that you want to do. Quit talking about going into tribulation all the time. Clean up what's left in your life and get on your knees and on your face and build that relationship with Jesus that your lifestyle of holiness allows you to have. It always amazes me that the people who have a lifestyle of holiness are the ones that shun the relationship. And the ones who are trying to get the relationship are the ones who don't live a lifestyle of holiness. Holiness is defined in the book of Leviticus. You can't define it anywhere else. Okay. Paul's commentaries. Paul's letters in here. You can't understand them until you understand Torah. 
You've got to study the first five books of the Bible until you understand the way of life and the pattern of life and the order that God has given everything. Then Paul's letters will make sense. Paul's not telling you the law is done away. Paul's telling you that living by the law will not pay for the transgressions you already made. It Amen. takes the blood of Jesus to pay for the transgression. But because you need the blood of Jesus to pay for your transgression does not mean you keep transgressing. The blood of Jesus is supposed to help you quit transgressing because you realize that you're afflicting him anew every time you do it. And you have a renewal of the power of the Holy Spirit, which should turn you away from transgression. That's why you can't keep breaking the Sabbath. God has winked at these for a time, but the time of looking the other way is up. And now it's the time for counting. The last time we spoke on the rescue 101, I told you that in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10, it's that word anacapalu is like a accountant running a 10-key tape, totaling up a column of figures. He's adding the names. He's subtracting the names. If you're not keeping the Sabbath, there's a minus sign by your name that you cannot remove any other way. To have that plus sign by your name, you must keep the Sabbath holy. It is the mark of God on your life for the rescue. Pray, Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, we glorify you, be lifted up, magnify and exalted this day, Lord. And this message as it goes out.